Okay, so uh, this second lecture, which is also background uh, for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, requires that we go back again, um, sort of. I mean, what I'm going to do is give you more, more background, and also we're going to come back to what was happening in Afghanistan in, during this time, because this is a whole another story. Now, it's not going to have at all the length of the first um, the first lecture, which was, gives the deep background about the first Gulf War. Okay, so here's the slide about what I'm going to talk about, uh, <clears throat> these four parts, where I'm going to start with Afghanistan, and so this first part is meanwhile in Afghanistan. All right. So this we have to go back, <clears throat> don't groan, <laughs> we have to go back to 1980 now so that we can come back up to 2001. Because what's going to happen is that the first war is going to happen in the place that we don't, we don't really talk about. And we have to put Afghanistan on the map quite literally. Um, and so I'm going to show you a map here of um, basically Central Asia. And I want you to see it uh, so that you see it in the context of what we have been talking about. But we're shifting now east. And, um, and what you'll see if you look down at the bottom where you'll see my big red, my big orange arrow that says, yeah, yeah, look down here. It's like this is where Afghanistan is. And then you'll see Iran and then Iraq and then Syria, which is up to the upper left of, of Iraq. Okay. Uh, in 1978, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan seized power during a revolution. The PDP was a communist party. So if you remember uh, when I was talking about the beginnings of and the ongoing Cold War, we're in the middle of the Cold War here. It's 1978. Reagan is about to come into power. It's three years after Vietnam. And the United States and Russia, the Soviet Union, um, the, 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 union of, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, are basically fighting it out for the planet. And um, so when the Communist Party gets in in Afghanistan or try, takes, tries to take power, um, the Soviets come in behind them and say, okay, we'll support you. And uh, they commit help to begin fighting the Mujahideen. And uh, let me put this up on the slide uh, because this is one of these words which gets abused almost immediately, uh, mostly because it's too long. Um, for Westerners to say, apparently. Um, so it gets mangled. Anyway, so here's the here's the word itself, and it is going to be it is going to be shortened drastically in the next uh, couple of in the next little while. <laughs> Not long for us, like in a few minutes. <laughs> but it loosely means mujahideen. Loosely means those engaged in jihad. Another word, which is going to be very important to us. Now, a jihad is defined as a holy war, but it doesn't actually mean violence, which is the way it's been portrayed by the Western press. And the problem partly has to do with the, the word war, right? Um, if it were something like holy mission, um, maybe the pictures that have grown up around jihadists would be different. Maybe not. I don't I don't know. I mean, yeah. If you're if you're racist, um, then you're gonna find ways to to uh, make the other the other. Okay. So as I say, it doesn't really necessarily mean violence at all. What it, what it means is to proselytize, um, which is true with many Christian sects as well. Um, which is to spread the word. Um, 
which is, yeah. At any rate, the American and Canadian soldiers uh, soon shorten Mujahideen, this is in the 21st century, to Muj, which looks like this. And they will start calling all citizens of Iraq and Afghanistan Haji, which looks like this. And Haji means uh, really those who complete a religious um, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, which is to go on a Hajj, which is a religious, religious pilgrimage. And Mecca is considered to be the center of the Islamic world in the same way that Jerusalem is considered to be, and the Dome of the Rock are considered to be the center of Christian world and the Judaic world and so on, and also part of the Islamic world. Um, it could be worse uh, than to call people Haji. Um, effectively, it's like calling, and you'll see this in Westerns, remember I've, I've been talking about Westerns a lot, it's not unlike John Wayne, as he often did, or, uh, talking about those pilgrims, because the job of the people carrying weapons was basically to make sure that the pilgrims, which were people who were leaving from the east coast of the United States or anywhere in the east, to go west across the United States on a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage to new land, right? So it's the great, the great capitalist pilgrimage. <laughs> Jeez. Many, that's not really quite accurate because many of the pilgrimages were also religious. For instance, the founding of uh, Utah and at the Great Salt Lake is a religious pilgrimage. And the, the idea, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons as we otherwise know them, um, had just as much of a religious mission um, there that the Muslims do when they go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. At any rate, the people who make up these uh, groups, what America would have called freedom fighters then, and now would call insurgents or terrorists uh, because it's all about perspective, remember? I mean, if they're fighting for your people, they're freedom fighters. And if they're fighting against you, they're terrorists, basically. Are from various ethnic groups in Afghanistan, all enormously complex and diverse. And to look at the history of Afghanistan is to look at a deep, wide, massive, it's a massive country. And it's the, belief systems are complex and so between 1979 and 1989 the Mujahideen fought the Soviet Union right? because the Soviet Union was in supporting the People's Workers Party and uh, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan and uh, by 1989 uh, and okay so between 79 and 89, basically the Soviet Union is in uh, supporting its own government while well, supporting the government, which is communist, against the Mujahideen. And the Mujahideen are like, get out, basically. You know, we don't need you and we don't want these, this party and we don't forget it. Get out of here. This is not how we're doing this. And so the Soviet Union found itself, ironically, just after having watched uh, an empire get bogged down, bogged down, just decide to stay in Vietnam and commit these terrible atrocities, the Soviet Union did the same thing. So there it was uh, for basically roughly 10 years, well, sort of nine, between 1980 and 1988, 1979, 1988, depending on how you count, um, engaged in this weird Vietnam where they supported a government, which was not popular necessarily with the whole group, and fought guerrilla insurgents. And <laughs> in a rare reverse uh, display of what I mean, it wasn't really surprising at all, the United States came in on the side of the Mujahideen and said, well, we're going to support you. <laughs> so, so in this reversal, the Soviet Union was the empire and America supported the guerrillas. Okay. By 1989, as you remember, the Soviet Union collapses and the Berlin Wall comes down and the Soviet regime and uh, the sort of program of 
whatever you want to call uh, the Soviet Union. So it was a socialist republic, okay? So that fails, um, and the troops have to come home because there's just no money, and anyway, there's no political will. I mean, who's going to keep the troops fighting for a country, a nation, an organization, the, the Soviet, the, the Union, basically the Soviet Union, um, which no longer operates, no longer functioning. So the uh, Soviet Union begins to bring its troops home. And by 1989, the Af Afghanistan has been left in, it's the state that it was, They basically the Soviet Union pulls out, that's it. And despite killing a lot of people, so this is a very familiar story, right? Despite killing a lot of people, the Soviet Union, in its 10 years of basically of fighting in Afghanistan, is unable to overcome the local forces and keep its government in place. So, you know, there's, you would think that people would get the message here that if you intervene uh, in, in a foreign, in a sovereign nation's mm -hmm. politics, um, you are going to get dirty. You are already dirty, but you are going to get dirtier and people are going to die. And the Soviet, the Soviet troops, um, were really had no more interest in the war in Afghanistan in the 80s than the American troops late in the Vietnam War had in the Vietnam War. They were like, why are we here? And there's a, I think her name is Svetlana Andropov. I cannot remember. I will put it up here. But there's an interesting book about these troops called Zinke Boys. And uh, they were called Zinke Boys because the coffins that the Soviet Union used to transport the troops home were made of zinc. Um, and so they were called Zinke Boys. So you can see why Afghanistan has been called, I mean, this is just a little one little example, has, but Afghanistan is known, it's infamous worldwide, and is known as the graveyard of empires. Um, and this is because if you go back a couple of thousand years, it defeated Alexander the Great and some of the most powerful South Asian princes um, all across, you know, who, who went to Afghanistan to try to colonize it, basically. Um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it utterly destroyed the British um, as it attempted to colonize the region. And by 1989, the Soviets had joined this group and some 15,000 troops had died, few willingly. So 15,000 troops, that's a lot of people. Um, that's three times the incoming class, say, <clears throat> at uh, a year a, a year Western, right? Okay, so incoming class about five thousand people. Okay, well, as before, who supported who? Right? Who supported the anti-communist Mujahideen? Because the Mujahideen. We're like, get them out, get these people out of here. Okay, we're just gonna fight. And the United, well, the United States, of course, supported them, supplying arms and significant amounts of money throughout the war. I cannot believe it. Have, can we not have this? We're, I don't want a tornado, but I'm like, you know, okay, shut up. Okay. I've had three tornado warnings. Whoops. <laughs> My phone has been going off like a bomb and enough. <laughs> it's like I appreciate the caution and at the same time, we're good.